And I'm going to be talking to you about how a modern bioinformatician organizes their work. So this talk is about uh, background motivation and theory while everyone sort of settles and <laughs> gets ready for the practical sessions. Uh, I'll be talking about how data management applies to genomics, how our data sort of cascades through multiple stages, uh, issues around reproducibility, um, and then how do containers and workflows fit into that, uh, that sort of uh, concept and into those concepts and why you should use these approaches versus, versus others. Slide. So yeah, so uh, surprise, surprise, this course is actually about more about data management than it is about genomics per se. Uh, the kind of questions that um, you sort of run into when you run into data management is, and this is the kind of thing that when you're dealing with genomic data, you suddenly have to think more and more and more about these, where you're thinking this isn't really about the science. You have problems like who decides how the data will be used? How do we secure our data? How do we use our data ethically in terms of like privacy concerns? How do I know how data was generated in terms of provenance? So software versions or database versions so that I can kind of reproduce it or someone else can follow what I've done. Um, have you run into issues with data management already? Uh, maybe this is sort of a problem that you've already run into with your projects that you sort of were thinking, this isn't really the scientific thing I signed up for. You don't have to get too specific, but just sort of generally what were the kind of things that you, you, you've you run into in the past. Maybe just pick one situation that sticks out in your mind and just post that into the Discord and Modern Bioinformatics. I'm really curious to see what people have run into into the past. Uh, our data, I think any project I've ever been involved with follows a particular pattern. And there are these sort of stages that we go through in, in, in sort of, and I mean project like a PhD project or sort of extended uh, project that leads to a publication, not necessarily someone just emailing me and asking me, oh, Nabil, what happens with, with X or what does this say? Uh, but in any extended project, you have this first stage where you're gathering your sequence, you get your sequence data from somewhere you get a bunch of published data, you have some experimental data on top of that, you go to some iterations of analysis and visualization, uh, and you have some sort of working storage space in which you are sort of launching these, these different tasks. And then you get to the next stage where you're starting to disseminate your results. So you're uh, publishing it, you're compiling tables to put into publications, like supplemental data, and you're submitting it to sequence archives and so on. And then some of it you might decide you're kind of done with and you, and you need to destroy it. So sort of intermediate files as well, you just sort of destroy them because you're kind of, they take up a lot of space and uh, you just don't want them anymore. So you kind of go through these different stages. And so here's another representation of that giving a bit more detail and I kind of think about it in terms of primary data, secondary data, tertiary data, where your primary data is your sequence data and your contextual data. So uh, information about the samples that you're interested in. So host or spatial or temporal information. And you're going to take that, that sort of raw, inf raw data and you're going to massage it to uh, a combination of workflow software, which is sort of chaining a procedural software that sort of glues analysis software together and then operates on this primary data to produce some sort of secondary data. So this is raw data, raw results that uh, represent your primary data. So things like a genome assembly or a consensus sequence or uh, genotyping, or there's, there's an infinite number of these examples. And then you'll take this information that you sort of understand and then go to a stage of visualization and document preparation to produce your tertiary data. So your figures, your manuscripts, your tables, your uh, data on ENA and things like that. In principle, what we kind of think about is that the combination of your primary data, your workflow software, your analysis software, and, being, and knowing which one of those you've used and the combination of your visualization and, and documentation processes, you should effectively be able to regenerate your primary, your, your results, your final output from, from just that. And you should effectively be able to delete your secondary data 
in your tertiary data without any any major problems that that's how it should be in theory <laughs> but that it often doesn't work that way and uh one of the things i wanted to to mention with that is that in the previous slide there's this assumption that this is like a sync this is like a, a linear path where you you stage your data and then you just process it and then you just write the paper and that often is not what happens you wind up in this bioinformatics ouroboros thing so the the ouroboros is is the 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 serpent that eats its own tail and it often feels like that with projects where you're just going round and round in circles and what happen, often happens is you get to the stage where you've massaged your primary data you've generated some more results you start to look at it and you realize actually I need to go back and modify my primary data like uh, you need to remove samples because of quality control concerns or you need to uh, add you you see a result that's interesting and you want to expand on it so you need to add more data maybe public data to to expand on that and you have this sort of iteration cycle where you go round and round and i wanted to point this out because when people talk about the ability to uh, reproduce or rerun analyses it's sort of couched as if there's this there's this person there's this hypothetical person who's going to come back to your paper and rerun your analysis and you sort of think well no one's really going to do that but actually more often than not it's actually you you are that person who's going to go back and rerun your data over and over again to try and get the results you want i think for any given project i might have done gone through the circle three or four times and so it's really important and, and over a period of like maybe two or three years in a, pro, in, a, in a genomics project. So it's really, really important that you know how you've uh, generated or operated on your data and you're able to sort of rerun it and process it. And that's uh, so, so the process is iterative, um, even within projects as you're working on it. So um, I was also uh, curious, why do you want to learn about workflow languages and, and containers? Uh, you can reply in the Discord channel, uh, Modern Bioinformatics. I'm quite interested to hear what people's thoughts are, um, why, why they're sort of on the course. And is it kind of this problem that they've run into, this circular uh, issue where they've run something and they're trying to, they don't remember how they've done it. They sort of like rerun the same thing, rewrite the same scripts over and over again. So going back to this, this sort of thing, primary data, secondary data, tertiary data, the containers and workflow fits into your projects and sort of this component. They are going to, the things like snake make and workflow are going to provide you the workflow software and uh, the singularity Docker and Conda are going to provide you the analysis software. They're not analysis software themselves, but they will uh, manage those and install those and keep them up to date and allow you to track what, you, what versions you've been using. And really what we're talking about in this sort of workflow of how your data moves, we're not talking about primary data and we're not talking about your final, how you pro produce your final figures. We're just talking about this secondary stage where you're, you're running things on your primary data. And how do you do that effectively? How do you generate your secondary data, your raw results data? and um, using these different these different platforms. And that this is where they sort of fit in into your, your general work uh, workflow in your project. So I'm going to to talk about a container and what's it for. So a container come is actually uh, from software development and software deployment. Um, Docker is 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 the most famous uh, of these. And um, it was originally designed more for testing and continuous integration. The idea would be that a developer would have this self-contained container, this environment where they would develop a piece of software. And then there would be the container would retain all of the information to run it exactly the way the developer had on their own computer. I don't know if you've ever run into the problem where you run a program and you say it doesn't work. And then the person replies back, hey, well, it works for me. Well, this gets around that problem because this just takes that person, that the environment that that person ran the program when they wrote it and gives it to you exactly as it is. And this is really powerful because what you can do with the container is you can then just launch it on anything that supports that container uh, framework. You can put it on, new, on an infinite number of servers as required and have 
whatever user number of users using it, and they will see exactly what the you as a developer can see. So this is a very important thing in sort of the software development cycle. It allows you to test it really easily and know that it's going to do what it's supposed to, and it allows you to push updates really quickly. So if you need to change something, you change the container, all these other uh, backend services, just pull the container down and um, everyone just gets the same up, everyone's up to date and working with the latest version. So this usually for uh, software engineering, this applies to things like web applications uh, for very fragile applications that need a very specific environment to run or for pipelines that have a lot of dependencies that are a bit difficult for a person to, in, a user to install themselves. It, because it does this thing of self-containing it and makes this environment, it's a bit difficult to work with graphical user applications or interactive applications or tools that use the file system a lot that need to go to the, to the, the system that they're working on and ask for, for, for different files because the thing inherently is trying to be self-contained. You can do it, you can do it, but it's a little bit more tricky. You're sort of fighting uh, what, the, what the tool is actually for. We use it in bioinformatics for a slightly different reason. We use it because bioinformatics software actually never really leaves this software development cycle where the developer is constantly updating it and working on it. And often the software is, is quite fragile um, because of that. And for that reason, we sort of recommend containers as a way of deploying bioinformatics software, even though a lot of bioinformatics software probably reaches a, a fairly mature change in that state and doesn't change very much. Now, um, I'm going to make a distinction between uh, containerization and virtualization. They're effectively the same idea that you have these self-contained little boxes and you, you play around with your application in that space. Uh, containerized applications, as I've just described, is you have this, this container and you have your app. App A uh, is, does not interact with app B, C, D, or F in, in the diagram. So what happens in app A, the software available to app A, that's app A's problem. And B does its own thing and C does its own thing. These are specified by the developer and then they run to a platform like Docker. And what Docker is doing is it acts like an interface to the host operating system, whatever that is, and converts the environment app A is expecting to, to operate on the, on the backend infrastructure. The app believes that it is working in the way the developer de uh, designed it. So, so for instance, you can have a Docker image that's developed for Linux working on a Windows machine or an OS X machine or something like that. The, the app doesn't know. The infrastructure can effectively be anything. Um, and because it's just specifically the uh, tools, the packages, the modules that the app requires to run, it's, it's very lightweight and easy to run multiple uh, containers at a time on a single uh, machine. Virtual machines are kind of the same concept, uh, more or less, but they are front loaded with a lot more information because they're trying to contain not only the app, but also the guest, the operating system as well, the entire operating system with all of its bells and whistles as well. With, with the virtual machine. And you're gonna be playing with all of the, the virtual machines, the, the cloud, the QIB cloud things you're playing with are virtual machines. They are set up the same way. It's something that's running Linux, Ubuntu. And then there's a, a layer of the hypervisor that is then converting it to run on the, the backend infrastructure. You don't know what the infrastructure is. You don't care as long as, it, as it, it'll just work. Um, uh, seamlessly. And often what, what happens is in terms of development is you swap the infrastructure. We, we migrate the physical high, hardware, we move you from one server to another, uh, and, and you as a user would never notice. So uh, I'll very quickly talk about the differences between Docker and Singularity. So Docker and Singularity are two uh, platforms that you can use for container, for getting containers and working with them. As I said, Docker is more for software deployment and development. It has this little Docker daemon that sits in the background and listens to all of your commands. Generally speaking, the reason why Docker is so, um, so uh, popular is because the user interface is very, very easy. And we'll see that in the next session, in the next set of talks. Um, but because it's got this software deployment um, background and use case, it's sort of better on a, on a single VM desktop 
a, a laptop machine for yourself. That, that tends to be where it works best. Singularity is something that came a little bit afterwards, and that was specifically designed for uh, HPC, for computing clusters, where you've got a shared resource. Uh, it's newer, so some features are a little bit more unpolished compared to Docker, um, but, it's, but the advantage of using Singularity is that it'll work on not only a VM or a desktop or a laptop, but it'll also, you can take your Singularity images and, and fairly easily run it on a uh, HPC cluster, standard HPC cluster. The other thing to mention is you can convert from Docker. So if someone has built a Docker image, you can easily convert that and rebuild it as a singularity one. It's a single command to do it. So there is this sort of interoperability between the two platforms. Now I'll just very quickly talk about uh, workflow, workflow languages. Um, Today we're going to be talking mainly about SnakeMake uh, and, and NextFlow. And this comes back to the concepts of the Unix philosophy and the idea of pipes. So Unix as an operating system was had this idea, it was built around this idea that you make singular little tools that do one thing and they do it really, really well. And you chain them all together to pipes, you pipeline, you pipe it. So, so the, the analogy that was originally used is like connecting pieces of garden hose. You have one, one pipe, you connect it to another one, you connect it to another one and you, you put everything through this, this, this uh, uh, amalgamated pipe. Um, the classic example, if you've done this, is the sort of example I'm giving down at the bottom, which is like SAM tools, which is like view a BAM file, uh, grep out a particular string and then pipe it back into another BAM file. So you're doing like this filtering step. There's actually three separate programs that are being run there, one after the other, uh, to get the result. And the key thing there is that, that vertical line, the pipe. That's something that um, these workflow languages like NextFlow and SmakeMake are sort of built around this philosophy. Uh, and the idea is to help you do more advanced orchestration uh, in, in that same sort of, uh, with that same sort of idea. So these tools do a number of different advantages for you. They hide the file management. Usually like you have to, you'll do something, you'll make an intermediate file and you'll do something else and you'll make an intermediate file and you have to track like, was that file created correctly? Uh, these don't, you, you don't have to worry about that. These handle all of that file management for you. It'll warn you if something's gone wrong. Uh, Often when you're working, you will work on your laptop and you'll do process one file at a time and then you wait. And then you come back and then you process the next file or you do some sort of crude bash loop to kind of iterate through, through your work. It, what you really wanna do is you wanna have your data in a queue and you wanna run as many of those at once, maybe two at a time, three at a time, four at a time. That's usually quite complicated to just write from scratch. These platforms allow you to do that really, really easily. It's baked into the way these are designed. So these effectively work like glue. So if you take this example here of this, this uh, basic assembly pipeline and you see these little outputs that it generates and it goes from FastQC to mega spades or something, something, something. Um, what the next one sake make is all of those arrow lines that is like stitching it all together. And that's really all it's supposed to do. They don't care what you're actually running. You can, it doesn't even have to be bioinformatics software. You can just have a, a next pipeline that does effectively um, cat, then grep, then, then WC runs orc. Like you can just write that as a next pipeline. It doesn't, it doesn't have any problems with that. Um, so why should you use one? A few things is that uh, on top of what I said is that these platforms give you version tracking built into it, not only for the pipeline, but also not for the instance of the pipeline that's run, but also for the software that's part, that's sort of underlying it, the packages you've used and so on. It sort of makes you specify that. Uh, it's portable. Things like NextFlow and SnakeMake are very easy to bundle up and give to someone else so that they can run in any environment. They're reproducible because of all of because everything is very verbose. It's easy to scale up and scale out. So you can develop something on Nextflow uh, workflow, have it running on your laptop, and then it's just like one configuration option, and you can start running it on a cluster, or you can run it on the on the cloud or something like that. The other advantage is is checkpoints or the the fact that you can resume uh, a workflow. So potentially maybe it runs halfway through and it stops for some reason. Um, 
or you want to go back and you want to change a parameter, you can do that. And anything that isn't affected, it'll just reuse that that information. So if it's just one file that needs to be changed, it'll run all the way through, but it won't regenerate everything for all the other files. The sort of caveats to a workflow language is the fact that um, rep, rep, uh, the ability to perfectly replicate what someone has done, it's not 100% that there are some edge cases where you where that's not going to happen. In most cases, it, it works, but the, it's not going to, if you have a next, like if you have a workflow language and you've done everything in containers, you're not necessarily, you can't just like think that you're going to get perfectly, someone else runs the same thing and get the exact uh, result. Uh, these, these workflow languages are just a thing to stitch the, the tools together. They're not interested, they don't provide you anything interpretation. They don't tell you which software to use. So you can just mash totally inappropriate um, algorithms together. Um, it, it's not gonna stop you as long as it sees there's an output from one and there's an input to the other, it'll just be like, yep, okay, I'm gonna do it. Um, and the other thing that you'll find is that maybe you're thinking, oh, I'll learn NextFlow and I'll learn SnakeMake and it'll make my life easy and I'll be able to do my work really, really fast. It's sort of, no. Um, you were going to spend time, you're going to front load your work where you're going to spend more time specifying uh, your environment and specifying your versions and thinking about how you stitch your tools together. And that's going to take you some time. And then you're going to run everything quite, quite calmly and be able to rerun really, really well. But effectively, it's probably going to balance out in terms of your time uh, that you spend. So, you know, if you, if this, um, what, the true advantage is in terms of time saving is that you hopefully will be able to pull existing workflows from other people and just use things off the shelf. Uh, that, that's the real time saving, but, but ultimately just starting from scratch and writing an Excel pipeline will probably take you the same amount of time to develop something if you were using something else, like you're just writing it straight in bash or you stitching some Perl scripts together. All right, so I'll just come back quickly to the schedule. This is the last slide from me. Uh, next up, we've got um, Anna 